What's up everybody? My name is Eric. Welcome to my channel, Eric the Tutor. What's up everybody? My name is Eric. Welcome to my channel, Eric the Tutor. Today, we're going to be talking about the central nervous system and the peripheral peripheral nervous system. We're going to go through some bony anatomy. We're going to talk about the spinal cord. We're going to talk about ganglia. We're going to talk about some cranial nerves, some spinal nerves. We're going to go through some clinical correlates such as Horner syndrome, shingles, and uh, the polio virus as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So here we got some bony anatomy. So let's go ahead and orient ourselves over here. So we're going to be looking at a single vertebrae, right? Here we have the vertebral column. That's all of the vertebrae lined up on top of each other. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the single vertebrae, which makes up one of many of the vertebral column. Okay, so if we look, we have a spinous process. We've got a spinous process here, and we have a body over here. So let's go ahead and orient ourselves. The body is located anterior. Anterior. And the spinous process is the most posterior. Okay. So that means if we're looking at our diagram over here on the right, that our image shows an anterior view on the right and a posterior view on the left. How did I know that? Because I see along the right here, all of my bodies lined up with each other. And I see all of my spinous processes pointing posteriorly. Okay. Next thing I want to point out. So we have a spinal foramen spinal foramen other known as otherwise known as the vertebral foramen not to be mixed up with an intervertebral foramen the spinal foramen or the vertebral foramen is where the spinal cord actually travels through so we have the spinal cord traveling through let's go ahead and show our spinal cord traveling through here right we got our spinal cord traveling through now in between the vertebrae, like I said, we have intervertebral foramen, foramina, right? So in between each vertebrae, I have intervertebral foramina, all right? This is significant because what travels through the intervertebral foramina? What do you guys think? Intervertebral foramina. That is where the spinal nerves is gonna, are going to exit. Spinal nerves exit via the intervertebral foramina. Okay, and that's, again, the individual vertebrae stacked up on top of each other. And the spinal nerves travel through the intervertebral foramina. All right, let's orient ourselves a little bit more. So over here, I have a transverse process transverse process these are going to be the most lateral lateral and lateral great all right the last thing i want to point out we have an arch an arch right here all of this is going to be our arch and specifically this location right here we have some lamina so right here we have lamina we have our lamina okay Perfect. All right, let's go ahead and move on. So we're going to go ahead and jump to the next slide. All right, so our next slide here is showing the spinal cord now. So we talked about the bony processes that are kind of encasing our spinal cord. Let's talk a little bit more about our spinal cord. So over here on the right, I have my spinal cord, right? And we see my spinal cord kind of begins to taper off. It kind of disappears almost right so as it tapers off that very tip of my spinal cord is known as my conus medullaris conus medullaris that is the very tip of my spinal cord we call it our conus medullaris my spinal cord ends we'll go ahead and show right here spinal cord ends at L1 to L2. All right. Now this is going to be important. So if we're doing a lumbar puncture, which we'll talk about in the next slide, if I want to do a lumbar puncture, I want to 
I want to pierce my needle and make sure not to hit my spinal cord, right? Because if I hit my spinal cord, that might cause paralysis. It might cause us some problems. So we're going to want to know where our spinal cord ends. And we know the tip of our spinal cord is called our conus medullaris. Now notice there's this single fiber that kind of travels all the way down to the sacrum, kind of comes off of that conus medullaris. That's my phylum terminale. My phylum terminale is that that extra piece that comes, that's like an extension of my spinal cord as it travels all the way down to my sacrum and attaches to the sacrum. All right, so that's my phylum terminale. Now, another thing I want to mention is see these, these little pieces kind of coming off here, all of this. All of this I'm labeling here in, in yellow. There we go. This is known as my, this is known as my, let's go ahead and put it over here. This is my cauda equina, cauda equina, okay? And again, those are just extensions kind of coming off of the spinal cord. And it's going to be encased in my subarachnoid space. It's basically bathed in CSF, in cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll get to in just a moment, okay? Now let's go ahead and orient ourselves over here onto the left side of our screen. So now I see another image here, which is going to be very important for our class. So let's go ahead and do some annotating. Right here, let's go ahead and do it in a different color. This is going to be my spinal nerve. Now what did we say about our spinal nerves? We said our spinal nerves travel through our intervertebral foramina. So this is my spinal nerve exiting the vertebral column. All right, so now let's go ahead and trace it back up to the spinal cord, okay? So if I have a spinal nerve, my spinal nerve will ultimately become, here I have some roots. So here I have roots, all right? So I'm going to have, I'll draw it down here. I'm going to have a dorsal root. So this is my dorsal side, and this is my this is my ventral, ventral side. Another name would be anterior. Dorsal would be posterior. So I have a dorsal root. Here we have a dorsal root, okay? And over here I have a, let's call this a ventral root, okay? My dorsal root is going to meet with my ventral root, and they're going to become a spinal nerve. Okay, so that's kind of what I've labeled up here. This is my spinal nerve and these two individual pieces are going to be a dorsal root and a ventral root. So this would be a dorsal root. This would be a ventral root. All right, so ventral root and a dorsal root. So right here, while I drew this bulge, this is something known as my dorsal root ganglia. Now, what exactly is a ganglia? Well, we have to define what the central nervous system is. The central nervous system, I'll write up here, central nervous system equals brain plus spinal cord. Okay, brain plus spinal cord. Now, we know all of this right here in the bottom left hand of our screen is spinal cord. Okay, this is our spinal cord. A ganglia is defined as a collection of cell bodies outside of my central nervous system. So collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system, okay? So here, my dorsal root ganglia, we call it a ganglia because it's outside of my spinal cord. We said this was my spinal cord and we're defining a ganglia as a collection of cell bodies outside of that central nervous system. So this ganglia is outside of my central nervous system. Here are all the cell bodies. And so these are my axons traveling and they're going to synapse right here, okay? So this is a dorsal root. And we said down here, this is going to be my ventral root, ventral root. And we said they meet to become a spinal nerve. Now my spinal nerve is going to diverge. It's going to diverge into a thinner dorsal rami, so let me go ahead and label this, dorsal 
ramus for singular, rami for plural, and a little bit of a thicker, let's go ahead and make it extra thick. This is my ventral ramus. Now, why are these important? So let's go ahead and talk about our dorsal root to one more time. So our dorsal root over here is afferent. Afferent. Now, afferent simply means it's taking in information, which another word for that is sensory. So my information is coming in this way. It's coming over here. It's telling my brain, okay, there's something that I just touched. I might want to move my hand. So if I want to move my hand, here are my collection of cell bodies. We don't call it a ganglion because it's within the central nervous system. I got that information and I want to move my hand now. So down here, my ventral, new, my ventral root is going to be motor. So it's going to be motor. Another word for that is efferent. So the information came in. That was the blue piece of information. My blue information came in. That was sensory. It went to my spinal cord. And my spinal cord said, okay, I want to move my leg. So let's go ahead and move it. This is efferent. This will be my efferent response. So let's go ahead and draw my efferent response heading in this direction. Now I reach my spinal nerve. So we notice here in my spinal nerve, I have some sensory information. And I also have some motor information. So my spinal nerve has both sensory and motor. Okay. Now that sensory information could have came in from this way or it could have came in from this way. So we, know, we have to make a note that our dorsal rami and our ventral rami can have both sensory and motor information, all right? The dorsal ramus comes from the erector spinae muscles, erector spinae muscles, plus the skin over those muscles, okay? So that's why that area is not as big, it's not as thick, but down here it's much thicker because this goes to the rest of the body. This is motor for rest of the body, not just our lower back muscles keeping us upright. That's our ventral ramus. So I can say rest of body. So rest of body, it's going to be motor and sensory information. Okay. All right. So now back up here at the top, after we have roots, we have little rootlets. Now, if we damage one of those rootlets, it's probably not going to cause too much damage. But if we if we damage an entire root or if we damage an entire spinal nerve, that's probably going to cause much more problems for us. OK, so that's basically everything for this slide. Let's go ahead and move on. All right. Next to, to the next slide. So we have sympathetic innervation and we have parasympathetic innervation. Let's go ahead and start with our sympathetic innervation. So we see here that my sense, my my innervation is kind of restricted between, let's go ahead and write it, between my T1 to L2. Okay, that's T1 to L2. Great. Now, let's go ahead and show. So, something interesting about my sympathetic innervation. I have this special thing over here that the parasympathetic innervation does not have. This, let's go ahead and show it in in red right here on either side of my spinal cord. That in highlighted in red is something known as my sympathetic trunk. Sympathetic trunk. Now, basically my sympathetic trunk is a way for me to transfer this inner this this information to different parts of the body now we said we're restricted to we're restricted to t1 to l2 but how am i going to get innervation or inner information um more superior than t1 right so here's t1 but i want to have some innervation all the way up to my eye right so how am i going to get innervation up to my eye if if the information is stopped at T1. Well, basically, you can think of this as, let's go ahead and zoom in. You can think of this as an elevator. So if, if T1 says, okay, I'm going to send some information out, I want it to go to the area of T1, then it can do just that. It can, it can go from T1 and, and travel out and, 
and go to the cardiac and pulmonary plexuses and go to the lungs and T1. Or we can say, okay, I want to take my information and I want to go from T1, but I don't want to go to the lungs. I'm going to bypass my lungs. I'm going to take my sympathetic elevator and I'm going to go to this special region here. This special region is known as my superior cervical sympathetic ganglia. This is my superior cervical sympathetic ganglia. Okay, so I want to bypass T1 and I want to go all the way up to the eyeball. I'm going to go to my superior cervical sympathetic ganglia and I'm going to take that information and I'm going to send it all the way up to my eyeball. So that's what the sympathetic trunk does. It says, I'm limited between T1 and L2, but I want to send information above and below T1 and L2. So I'm going to ride my sympathetic trunk. I'm going to ride my sympathetic trunk either all the way up or all the way down. And I'm going to go to wherever I need to go. Okay, so that's what the sympathetic trunk does. Now, if I define what ganglia was I defined what ganglia was earlier so let's go ahead and define what preganglia is preganglia says I have some some cell bodies located within my spinal cord so here's my here's my preganglion cells and I'm going to go and I'm I'm going to let's say I want to go to the lungs so I'm going to have a preganglion neuron so over here in red this is pre ganglion neuron. So I have my preganglion neuron. And I'm going to synapse onto my ganglion. Now we know this is my ganglion because I'm outside of my central nervous system. So if I synapse onto my ganglion, then I'm going to have to have a postganglionic neuron that's going to travel all the way. It's going to travel all the way to my lungs, right? So it's a two- neuron it's a two neuron system so this was postganglionic postganglionic neuron so autonomic neurons autonomic neurons are a two neuron system this is a two neuron system okay so we had our preganglion neuron in the spinal cord it's going to go and it's going to travel it's going to synapse onto my ganglia and from my ganglia, I'm going to have a postganglionic neuron that's going to travel to my targeted, uh, my targeted organ. Okay, great. Let's talk a little bit about the parasympathetic innervation. Let's talk about parasympathetic innervation. So over here, notice we don't have anything between T1 and, and L2. There's nothing there. Instead, up here, we have our cranial nerve. So my parasympathetic parasympathetic preganglionic neurons can be found in the brain stem brain stem and specifically these preganglionic neurons travel through cranial nerves 3 7 9 and 10. You're going to want to know those ones, all right? So my preganglionic parasympathetic neurons travel through crani cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10. Okay, so that's my preganglionic neurons. All right, so that's my preganglionic neurons. And down here, we also have some preganglionic neurons that are coming from my spinal cord. This is going to be between S2 to S4. So these also are preganglionic, preganglionic parasympathetic neurons. So I have preganglionic parasympathetic neurons that are located in the brainstem that travel through cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. And I have preganglionic parasympathetic neurons that travel between S2, S3, and S4. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much everything for this slide. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so now we're on to some clinical correlates. So here, let's go ahead and talk about a lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture. 
But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the different the, the, the different meninges. Now meninges is basically what meninges is what's covering the brain and the spinal cord. So this covers brain and spinal cord. Now the meninges are three different layers. So we have three layers. We have our dura. So I'll go ahead and show right here. We have dura and then we have arachnoid and then pia. So dura, dura is most superficial, most superficial. And the pia is the deepest, deepest. Now my pia is basically on my spinal cord. The pia is microscopic to the naked eye, microscopic. So you, you can't actually see the pia. If you see the spinal cord, you're looking at pia mater. All right, so now again, most superficial. What do we say we have? We have our dura, we travel a little bit deep to that. We hit my arachnoid mater. And deep to my arachnoid mater, I'm going to hit my pia mater. Good. Okay. Perfect. Now, there's a couple different, a couple different terms now that we know the three different layers that cover the brain and the spinal cord. Superficial to my dura mater, out here I'm in my epidural space. Now we know this is going to be important because epidural space is the site of an epidural anesthesia or an epidural hematoma. All right, so this is my epidural space. Epi mean outside of my dura. All right, now another term we're, we're going to want to know is the subdural space. So if I go deep, deep to dura equals sub subdural space. Now, this is important because my subdural space is a potential space. Okay, you guys are going to want to know that one for sure. It's definitely a high yield question. Subdural space is a potential space, which means there shouldn't be anything in there. It should be so tight. It should be so close together that there should no should, there should not be really anything in there. There shouldn't be any any that's a site of an infection if there is something that's in there, right? Because it's a potential space. Some stuff could maybe get in there and that's gonna cause problems, all right? That's my potential space, my subdural space. So again, let's let's recap. So the most superficial before we even hit the dura, we're gonna hit our epidural space. And then as we go deeper, we're gonna hit my dura mater. As I go deep to my dura mata, I'm going to be between my dura and my arachnoid mata. So I'm deep to dura. I'm subdural. I'm in my subdural space. And then as I go deep to my subdural space, I hit my arachnoid mater. And as I go deep to my arachnoid mater, so it's deep to arachnoid, that's going to be known as my subarachnoid subarachnoid space okay so again epidural to dura to subdural space to arachnoid mater to my subarachnoid space and then i'm going to hit my pia mater okay and my pia mater is encasing my my spinal cord okay my subarachnoid space is going to be important because this is the area where csf is located okay this is going to be important clinically as well so if I'm doing a lumbar puncture, perhaps I want to enter. So over here, my image is over here. Perhaps I want to enter over here into the into the vertebral column, and I want to I want to take out some cerebral spinal fluid. So in this picture here, you can see the needle piercing through dura, and it's 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 piercing through subarachnoid, and then I'm I'm in my subarachnoid space, right? I I haven't quite hit my pia because my pia is encasing my spinal cord and I want to make sure I don't hit my spinal cord, right? So if I want to take out some CSF, maybe that's clinically important because if I remove CSF, I can do some lab analysis. So I can do lab analysis and I can see um, maybe if I if I take out some CSF and I get some blood, then I know there's maybe some bleeding in the brain. So the CSF is directly uh, in contact with the uh, with the brain, 
right? So if I'm in my subarachnoid space down there um, in, in the posterior, in the back, it's also going to be directly in contact, in communication with the brain, right? Because all these layers are encasing my brain and my spinal cord, okay? So that's what a lumbar puncture is. When I perform my lumbar puncture, performing lumbar puncture, I want to do it at, do it at L3, L4 or L4, L5. Now, why do you guys think that is? Well, my spinal cord, spinal cord ends at L1, L2. So I want to make sure I'm inferior to where my spinal cord ends because I don't want to pierce my spinal cord. So I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to go between L3 and L4 vertebrae or between L4 and L5 vertebrae. That's where I want to put my needle, okay? And that's whether to take out some CSF to run it for tests or maybe I want to, I want to inject some anesthesia there to, to perform an orthopedic surgery, perhaps in a total knee replacement or, or something along those lines. So this is a very important spot. In order to find L3 and L4 or L4 and L5, I want to... In order to do that, in order to be able to do that, I want to find my iliac crest. Find iliac crest. Okay, if I find my iliac crest, which is the top of my hip bones, and I trace it towards the center, the midline, I can find exactly where L3, L4 is. Okay, so use that iliac crest as a landmark to be able to find where to insert that needle when you're doing a lumbar puncture. Now, that's going to be very important clinically. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so now we're moving on to polio. Okay, so polio is paralysis of the, uh, of the muscles. So it's a motor problem. All right, so let's go ahead and write that. So polio is a motor problem. So do you think that's afferent or efferent? Yeah, if it's motor, it's going to be an efferent problem, right? Because we said earlier that afferent with an A is sensory. So this is purely a motor problem, purely motor. So you notice down here that this individual's leg is a lot smaller than his left leg. So his right leg is much smaller than his left leg. And over here we can see that indivi this individual's right leg is, is very affected. And we see there's weakening in the muscles and weakening in the bones. So we see that this individual is not able to keep a straight leg. It's actually bending over. It's causing quite a lot of paralysis. It could happen within a matter of hours. So the way it happens, the way it happens is this virus, so it's a virus, this virus migrates to the central nervous system. And it's actually going to travel to, it's going to travel to my anterior horn. Now, why do you guys think it's going to go to the anterior horn? Well, we said if we have our, say we have our spinal cord here, we have our little drawing right here, we have our little drawing. We said this side was going to be anterior. This is our ventral side. And back here, we said this is going to be posterior. This is our dorsal side, dorsal. If I have some sensory information here, here's my dorsal root ganglia. And down here I have some motor, some motor information. And here we said we had mixed, right? So we have mixed information, just like that. Well, if this is a problem at the anterior horn, this is where the virus is going to travel. It's going to travel right here. It's going to damage the anterior horn. So I'm not going to be able to have I'm not going to be able to have efferent function. So my motor, my motor is disrupted. My efferent, there's a problem with the efferent information. So I'm not able to send out the information to innervate those muscles to keep me, to, you know, to keep those muscles alive. So they start to um, kind of degenerate and atrophy. All right. So this is an example of a purely motor lesion. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So now I'm going to talk about herpes zoster, so other known as shingles. So let's let's go ahead and draw another representation here of our spinal cord. 
So here's our spinal cord. Perfect. So what did we say this side was called? This is our dorsal, dorsal horn. And what do we say this one was called? This is our ventral horn. And then over here, what's the sensory one called? With its ganglia, what's the ganglion called? This is our, what do you guys think? This is our dorsal root ganglia. Dorsal root ganglia. And down here we have our, we have our, efferent motor information efferent motor this is our ventral root we have this information go up this way and down this way and then this information is mixed here in our spinal nerve and we go to this and like that okay all right so with shingles shingles is a purely sensory problem so purely sensory problem so we're not going to be affected down here like we were with the polio virus. Instead, this virus, which is a result of chicken pox, so chicken pox at a younger age, chicken pox at younger age, is going to kind of manifest, and uh, the virus is going to lay dormant in my dorsal root ganglion. So virus lay dormant in my dorsal root ganglia. So when there's an episode of herpes zoster, typically when uh, after many years, when the individual is a lot older, the virus is going to reemerge and it's going to show up in these peripheral sensory nerves. So it's going to cause, it's going to cause problems, right? So if it's, if it's right here in my dorsal root ganglia, then I'm unable to get that information I'm unable to get that information to my spinal cord. So there's a sensory problem. Sensory problem, right? So I'm unable to get that information to my spinal cord. Um, there's going to be anesthesia. There's going to be paresthesia. There's tingling. There's um, loss of sensation. So basically there's loss of sensation and dermatomes innervated by the affected dorsal root. So my, my dorsal root is affected and my dorsal root has specific dermatomes so that's why you kind of see this show up in patches because specific dermatomes are affected uh, due to specific dorsal roots that are affected so this is purely sensory problem all right um, the last thing I actually want to mention I want to go back well I'll just talk about it down here so Horner syndrome is the last clinical correlate that I wanted to talk about. Clinical correlate. Horner syndrome is characterized as ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. All right, so what that means is ptosis is a drooping eyelid. And we'll talk about why in just a second. And we have meiosis and anhydrosis. My Osis is a constricted pupil, and anhydrosis is lack of sweating. Well, the reason for this, this is a sympathetic problem. So, let's say my superior cervical ganglion was affected, and my superior cervical ganglion provides the sympathetic innervation to different parts of the body. So, if I'm going to be fight or flight, fight or flight, I'm most likely going to be sweating. But if but if I if I have a a damage in the sympathetic superior cervical ganglion, then I'm not going to be able to sweat, right? It's I'm not going to be able to be in that fight or flight mode. That thing is damaged. I have a lack of sweating. That's the anhydrosis. The meiosis, so imagine, so this is fight or flight, so we said we want to sweat. This is if healthy. I'm going to fight or flight. I'm going to be sweating. I'm going to have a dilated pupil. Well, if my superior cervical ganglion, which travels all the way to my eye, is damaged, 
if there's some damage there at the superior cervical ganglion, then I can't get that information to the eye to say, hey, I need to dilate my pupil. There's a tiger in front of me. There's some stuff going on. I need to be able to see better. Let's dilate the eyes. Well, I'm not going to have that, right? So that's why my eye is going to be in a constricted. It's going to be constricted because it's not balanced out with a parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. It's only parasympathetic because the sympathetic was damaged. All right. The other thing is if I have, I want to have my eyes open. So eyes open, certain muscles, and we'll talk about them a lot later in the class. Certain muscles are going to keep that eyelid from, from, from drooping down. It's going to keep that eyelid open so you can see that tiger in front of you. But Again, if, sympath if there's a sympathetic problem, then I'm going to have a drooping eyelid. I'm going to have a drooping eyelid because that uh, sympathetic innervation that goes to that part of the eyeball to keep it up. It's called levator uh, papillae superioris. Okay? Levator pupillae superioris. All right? So that is everything. Thank you guys for listening. Um, that's pretty much about half of week one, there's a little bit of uh, muscles and scapula and the humerus. So we're going to try to talk about that stuff too. But for now, this was week one. All right. So just stay tuned. We're going to try to do videos every week. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate it. You guys have a nice day.